So we kind of already talked about the three areas geographically of the you know prehistoric Aegean. So the Cyclades, the we talked about Crete, we talked about Peloponnesus, but we didn't really talk about the name of the art that comes from each place. So um, Cyclades, islands, Cycladic art is from the Cyclade islands. Um, Crete features art known as Minoan art, which we sort of already talked about the Minoans, but Minoan art is found here um, after King Minos is what it's where the name comes from. And then the Greek um, mainland or the Peloponnesus features art that is called Helladic art. Um, and then each of these art periods in each of these three areas have basically an early, middle, and late period. And the late art from the Greek mainland is called Mycenaean. So Mycenaean is just part of the Helladic art, and it's usually it's actually a little bit later um, in the timeline. But the Mycenaeans are definitely, you know, we've been talking about them a little bit so far in this in this um, lecture, but they are actually later on um, just a part of a larger picture of Helladic art from the mainland. So we're going to start off actually talking about Cycladic art from the Cyclades Islands. And this is the early Cycladic period. And they produced large quantities of marble statues due to the abundance of marble on the Aegean Islands. So these marble Cycladic figurines feature simplified forms that are very abstracted. And they're kind of strikingly similar to modern sculptures made within like the last century, which was which has actually made them very popular because they do um, follow current trends or the trend of um, modern art, which a lot of people are really into. So there was so much demand for these Cycladic period sculptures that forgeries have really become commonplace. So most of the Cycladic sculptures represent nude women, much like the Venuses that we looked at in the prehistoric period. Um, these examples often depict women with their arms folded across their abdomens, possibly symbolizing fertility or reproduction. And these sculptures are found in caves and in settlements, and they vary in height from a few inches, and some of them are almost life-size. So this figure of a woman was from Syros, which is a Cyclade, Cyclades island. Um, Greece, 2600, 2300 BCE. It's marble, about one foot six inches high. And this actually comes off a grave off the island of Syros. And it's sculpture carved the figurine using probably obsidian tools. And then they polished the surface with a granular rock called emery, kind of where we get the emery stone or the emery board for filing our nails. Same it's a rock that is used for filing. Um, so a lot of triangles are found. There's a triangle in the head, the body, uh, the body tapers down. The pubis, as you can see, is also triangular. Um, so there's a lot of repeating triangular shapes here with this piece. It doesn't really have very many rounded lines. Um, there's some, but, and the toes are pointed downward. So the figurine, this figurine couldn't really stand upright. It, it had to be laid down or placed on its back. Um, much like the deceased, it had to be laid down. So we don't know exactly what these sculptures represent. They could be fertility figurines, goddesses. They may represent the dead. Um, the breasts in the pubic area are quite dominant. There's also a slight swelling of the belly on this. So that could, you know, symbolize fertility or pregnancy, um, paint has been found on these figurines, so they were at least partially painted. We know that, probably with brighter pigments. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Moving on, so we have a male harp player from Keros, which is also a Cycladic island in Greece, 2600, 2300 BCE. It's about nine inches high. It's made out of marble. And this represents a man, which is kind of rare in Cycladic statues. They're usually women. And this one shows a man playing a harp, and he may be playing for the deceased in the afterlife, although this is just a guess. 
Um, so we can see some of the same geometric forms, you know, some of the triangular forms that we saw in the last sculpture. Um, and the harp itself here actually has kind of a, a duck bill um, or swan head ornament on it. And the, the scholars believe that this harpist may be engaging in kind of a commemorative rite that is honoring the dead. And, you know, he's playing music. And as we saw earlier on the sarcophagus, it too featured a harpist. So that might have been an essential part of a long forgotten, you know, funerary custom. Um, since we don't have written documents in Greece from this date, it's hard to determine the exact purpose of these figurines, but there are a few um, you know, slight ideas of what it might, they might mean. So we're going to launch into Minoan art now. Um, that was Cycladic, mostly just figurines that are left behind from that area of ancient early, um, Cycladic art. But we're going to go into Minoan now, and this is during the second millennium known as the middle Minoan period on the island of Crete. And the construction of large palaces became a very common practice. So there's like several periods of, of palace building on the island of Crete done by the Minoans. Um, so there's the old pa palace period, and it ended quite abruptly in 1700 BCE when a fire swept through the island of Crete. And so the Minoans had to rebuild it immediately. And this is known as the new palace period. And it's kind of considered the golden age of Crete by many scholars. And the rebuilt structures were not actually palaces, they were actually administration administrative and commercial and religious centers so they kind of had everything in one place um they had a courtyard for ceremonies games um, they had shrines throughout they also featured storerooms for produce and good goods for the towns and the people around um so they were basically kind of the center of Min minoan life and the main palaces in the, on the island of crete are at nosos Phaestos, Melia, Cato, Zarco, Zacro, and Cania. So these complexes really help us understand the power and wealth of the Minoans. So this is the restored view of the palace at Knossos in Crete, um, Greece, 1700 to 1370 BCE. And this is the largest Cretan palace. It was King Minos's palace, and it's known to have resided in Knossos. And there was an ancient myth um, written down that the hero Theseus hunted the Minotaur, which is a half bull, half man, and he hunted it in the labyrinth of King Minos. And this labyrinth was possibly the palace, this palace pictured here at Knossos. Um, and Theseus actually defeated the monster and found his way through the maze-like palace or complex with the aid of the king's daughter, Ariadne. And she actually given him a spindle of thread to mark his way through this very intricate floor plan of the maze. Otherwise, he may have gotten lost forever after killing the bull in the labyrinth. And so they, the English word for labyrinth actually comes from the myth of the maze-like palace, which is probably, in all reality, the palace at Nosos, because it is very maze-like. And it's part of that kind of legendary thing that happens where it's it's based on something true, but it's kind of turned into a little bit more to make it more interesting and, you know, passed down orally from storyteller to storyteller. They start adding in more and more details to make it more interesting, such as, you know, the half man, half bull minotaur, um, stuff like that. So, so the mythological labyrinth was actually called the house of the double axe and the labyrinth double axe is the rear is very reoccurring symbol in Minoan art, and the double axe actually sac is um, symbolizing sacrificial slaughter. So it's all kind of tied in. So we can see kind of the plan of the palace of Nosos in Crete. Um, and it, it features a theater. It has, you know, some corridors, a, th a throne room, a central court, uh, a grand stairwell. Um, so you can look through each of these, but this palace at Knossos was built on top of a low hill that rises from the fertile land. And at the center of the palace was a courtyard and there was a series of residential and administrative rooms um, on the west side of the court, on the north-south corridor, 
Um, there were official and ceremonial and storage rooms, and they put, you know, wine, grain, oil, honey in large jars in these rooms. And then on the east side of the court, a smaller east-west corridor separates the administrative area from the workrooms. And at the northwest corner of the palace, there was a theater area with steps on two sides that probably served as seats. And this is kind of the forerunner to the Greek theater, so that's kind of cool. And its exact purpose is unknown, but a similar theater was also found within the palace at Phaistos. So that's also very interesting um, that that's the forerunner to the Greek theater. So we'll keep moving here. So this is the stairwell in the residential quarter of the palace of Knossos in Crete. Um, it not only had many rooms as palace, but it also had many stories as well. And around the central court, there were as many as three stories and some had as many as five stories. And st so stairwells were quite common and they actually helped provide natural light and they served as um, ventilation. So air could kind of circulate through the building and the palace. And the Minoans also set up a complex system of baked clay pipes or terracotta pipes under the enormous building that helped to drain away the rainwater, which was very sophisticated for the time. And as you can see in this picture, um, the columns have these really distinctive capitals and then a shaft that comes down. And the capitals are quite bulbous. They almost look like a squished ball. Um, and the column is actually thicker at the top and tapers down at the bottom which is the opposite of Egyptian and later Greek columns. So these columns were originally wooden, but they may have been, but they were actually reconstructed in cement later on here. So, but they were originally wooden. And it's kind of interesting to see how they interpreted the Egyptian column because the Egyptians came first and they were one of the first, if not the first civilization that we know of that used columns. And so they're borrowing from Egyptian um, civilization here with the with these columns and they're doing their own version of it. It looks different than the Egyptian um, columns did that we looked at in the last chapter. So we'll talk about Minoan painting next. Um, they're found in great numbers at the Palace of Knossos and they de depict many aspects of Minoan life, but they do feature nature as really the central element. So this is Minoan woman or goddess from the palace at Knossos, 1500 BCE, and it's a fragment of a fresco and it's about 10 inches high. It's called uh, La Periazini. Periazini. It's called, it, it means the Parisian woman. Um, and because of the elegance of the woman it depicts, it, it features a large frontal eye in a profile head. So we're seeing that same convention that we might have seen in, in Egypt with the profile head and the frontal eye. Um, so we're seeing a little bit of Egyptian influence in, in this piece. The Minoans coated the rough palace walls with a fine white lime plaster, and they actually used true fresco, which is different from the Egyptians, um, or buon fresco. And this means that the painter applied the pigments while the plaster was still wet. And they had to work rather quickly because it would dry quickly. Um, so they had to work while it was wet. and there's a really good reason to to work this way in wet plaster because the paint and the pigment from the paint actually chemically bonds to the plaster as it dries and it makes it insanely durable. So um, true fresco or um, you know wet fresco or buon fresco is definitely extremely dur durable and more so than um, than the other type of, I believe, fresco secco, which is painting on dry plaster. So um, in wet, if you paint into wet um, fresco or true fres fresco, it actually bonds, the pigment bonds with the surface and becomes very, very durable. But like I said, it did have some drawbacks. They had to, you know, the painters had to work quickly. Um, they had to execute their painting before the plaster dried. And like I said, the Egyptians worked in the dry fresco method. Um, Let's see, we might be running out of time. Okay, yep, I'll finish up here with this video and we'll start in the next video here.